Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone to the first in a series of Q&A webinars with Nakata leaders. Current Nakata president, David Spite, challenged the membership to get engaged and outlined four ways, suggestions to do just that. Get engaged in the profession, learn another approach, become a scholar practitioner, and get engaged in the association. The board of directors took on this challenge and developed four Q&A webinars featuring Nakata leaders and um, offering suggestions to help our members get engaged based on David's themes. The remaining dates and times for the webinars, for the rest of the webinars in the series are showing on your screen right now. And they can also be found on Nakata's website. The July 19th webinar featuring incoming President Dana Zahorek moderating Learn Another Approach, Let's Talk Advising. So please join her for that session. Let's get start, started with today's webinar. Get engaged in the profession. Let's talk core values. In today's webinar, we have a panel of Nakata leaders who have been working on talking to the members regarding our core values. Our goal today is to share with you what has been done to date and gain additional input and answer any questions you may have. So today's panels include Joanne Daminger from Delaware Technical Community College, Jane Drake from Temple University, Drew Pureway from the University of St. Thomas, and Casey Sell from Arizona State University. Thank you, panelists, for joining me. Nakata's Board of Directors decided it was time to review our values and asked Jane Drake and Joanne Daminger, both past Nakata presidents, to lead the review of the, our, our, uh, the review of our core values. Jane, I know that you were able to retire from Temple but I know that Nakata just won't let you retire. and We keep calling you back for more committees. So thank you for being here today. Pleasure. Could you please share with us about the importance of core values in general and the history of Nakata's core values? Absolutely, thanks Amy. As well, and, and so as we begin today, I would like to talk briefly, as Amy suggested, about the importance of even having core values in the first place and how they should function in all organizations and in Nakata in particular. And now, core values are important because they are truly, truly the foundations for building any great organization. They spell out what makes an organization different from every other organization, and they, um, they tell us what makes us different from other organizations, in Nakata's case, from other organizations in higher education. So our core values state what it is that's important about what we do, uh, they spell out what it is that we stand up for, which is important. Also, uh, core values uh, have certain values that are, uh, represent values that are common to all of us. For example, through our own professional development as advisors, we can all learn the skills and the strategies that help us to become effective advisors for our students and for everybody else that we come in contact with. But these skills that we learn and the strategies that we learn do not in and of themselves represent core values, but they uh, must be in alignment with what it is we stand for. In other words, our core values. So third, core values uh, communicate what's important, not just to ourselves, but also to our students, administrators, parents, anybody literally that we come in contact with. They are our creed to the world, if you will. Fourth, core values have the power to influence our behavior. We should be living out our core values in our day-to-day -day contact with our students and others. So it's important for us to know that, and it's important for others to see that. Fifth, core values should inspire people. And this is where I think the Rocky theme should be starting to play for us here. They should inspire people. The core values provide us with goals to live by and goals to live up to. And I think finally, the core values help us in a very quintessential way to shape our organization's culture. So I think this is why core values generally for any organization are important and why especially they are important to Nakata because it, it was with this understanding that in 1990, about uh, 26 years ago, a group of folks uh, felt the need to, to look into this. This was a, this thing called Nakata was a growing and it was uh, emerging into a major organization in higher ed. 
And then uh, everybody felt the importance of having a code of ethics, actually, to help guide the membership and their work as advisors. So it was this need that started surveys and started talks and discussions and presentations that stretched out over a couple of years and resulted in uh, Nakata's code of ethics. This statement of core values, as it eventually became known, was adopted by the uh, board of um, board of trustees for Nakata four years later in 1994, and the statement was reviewed again in 1998. Uh, then in 2005, additional changes were made. Now that was 10 years ago, and I think much has changed in those intervening 10 years, as you will as you'll hear from Casey in a moment. And it's I think again time to turn a critical eye on what it is that drives us and what it is that we stand for. So that's why core values and that's a, just a brief run through of the history of core values. Thanks Jane. That gives us some great background. Good. Good. Joanne, could you please explain further the charge that the the committee the charge that the board of directors gave to the committee and how the committee was established? Certainly. Thank you Amy. Well, as Jane mentioned, Nakata last revised the values in 2005. So the review committee was formed to take a look at the three components of the current statement of core values. And we know these are comprised of the introduction, the declaration, and the exposition. And the committee was asked to provide the board with recommendations for revisions. The board wants to assure that Nakata's core values represent the profession of advising for all advisors, advising administrators, students, and institutions. So the charge to the committee included the flexibility to, re, uh, to let the review process unfold. Therefore, the committee doesn't really have a set completion date for the revisions. It's important to the board and also, of course, to the committee that we see contributions from as many members as possible and that the process takes as long as is necessary. So the committee continues to think of different venues to collect member input. So speaking of the committee, soon on the screen, you will see the names of the review committee members. In forming the committee, Jane and I sought recommendations from the executive office and other Nakata experts. It was important that we have a diverse uh, committee in all areas of difference and assure that all Nakata's regions would be represented. Members were chosen for their different levels of experience and involvement with Nakata. And also, we wanted to be sure that we had people who could engage other not Nakata members in conversation about the values. And we looked for people who could lead future discussions to gather input. Well, the resulting committee, we have to say, uh, is a great committee. We're very proud of those uh, on the committee who actually have proven themselves to be great um, representatives and very committed to the process. Thanks, Joanne. That's a great committee representing the diversity of our members. Let's hear from another past president, Casey Self. Casey, can you share with us why this is a good time for the association to review our core values? Thanks, Amy. I'd be happy to. Some of you might be participating today and wondering why Nakata is reviewing these values since they've been such a staple for the association for many years. I think one of the strengths of Nakata is the fact that we stay on top of current issues and trends and that the leadership and executive office are always looking for ways to improve academic advising as a profession and the community. Eric White, another past president from Penn State University, recently published a terrific article called Academic Advising in Higher Education, a Place at the Core. In his article, Eric reminds us how those of us that were around in the 1980s and 1990s, and even in the early 2000s, would have to still use metaphors to help others understand the role and value of academic advising on our campuses. Equating academic advising to teaching, mentoring, counseling, coaching, for example, helped a burgeoning profession to explain itself. But now, after a generation of theory building and analysis of practice, what has emerged is, an, is a unique and informed endeavor of its own mission. Today, when you mention academic advising, especially within the greater higher education community, there is really no longer a reason to justify the existence or the value of academic advising. That is coming more and more naturally. So as a profession and as the association, we have moved to the point where we need to have language 
that accurately, accurately reflects who we are and where we are in today's higher education community. It has been 10 years since the last review, and most of you probably know with the, the, about the rapid growth of Nakata, not only here in North America, but also around the world. And we need to make sure that our values reflect this expanded community of academic advising. Also with the new developments for the Center for Excellence and Research in Academic Advising and Student Success, I believe this will also bolster even more how others outside of the academic advising perceive us and how our own membership will perceive our purpose and roles on each of our campuses. Communicating how academic advising does make a difference in student success and how our association documents this, documents support this is even now more critical. So these are all the points I can think of of why it is time to update the Nakata core values. Thanks, Casey. I'm excited about the new research center. Wendy Troxell, the new director of the center, will be speaking in the August webinar coming up soon. Next we have Drew Pureway, who has served as a Minnesota State Liaison and is current chair of the Theory, Philosophy, and History Commission. Drew, you have been involved in leading sessions at the regional level and for gathering information. Could you share with us the process the committee used to collect input from our NACADA members? Thank you, Amy. Um, so this is indeed a process uh, that can't be relevant without the widest possible involvement from the NACADA membership. And I'd like to just start by thanking um, everybody that's been involved in those conversations so far. And we began in um, last fall at the annual conference in Las Vegas. And this happened primarily through two sessions. There was the town hall meeting and the past president's forum. And these provided really great conversations and gave us ideas um, as a task force for where we needed to gain further insights. And so we, we got that and then we sort of took the show on the road and had these listening sessions at all 10 regional conferences. And these included both the opportunity to submit written notes and to engage in discussion. So uh, from that, detailed notes were taken at each regional listening session and then brought back to the task force. And <clears throat> Somewhere along the way, in, on April 19th, the core values uh, revisions were the topic of Nakata's uh, Tuesday Twitter conversation. And then there was a blog post on May 25th by my friend and mentor, Shannon Burton, reflecting on the great dialogue that happened in her, her region, Region 5. And lastly, the summer institutes will include a focus group uh, conversations on the core values. So um, what we used to kind of prompt those conversations, the, the question we used as a jumping off point was a really simple one. As a member of the advising profession, what are the most important values that guide practice? Um, this, provided, this, this proved to be a really fruitful um, kind of conversation starter, and I have to say it was really gratifying to hear the depth and passion with which participants expressed their ideas for revised core values and their critique of the old. Thanks, Drew. I was at one of those sessions and it was great. So all 10 region conferences along with the core values discussions at each conference have been completed. Jane and Joanne, would you share with us your early observations, what you're seeing and some themes that are emerging as, as, you, have begun to, as you have begun to review the input from our members? I can, I can start on this uh, slide that you see in front of you. Uh, we have the common observations and questions that have emerged from our discussion so far. And I think all of them raise important issues about who we are as a profession and our responsibilities and relationships to those uh, whom we come in contact with. Now, um, if you read the current core values document carefully, you see that they are largely practices rather than a philosophy per se. They describe what we do rather than who we are. So I think it's important to make that distinction. So here's what we're learning from the membership. We're learning that the, the current statement of core values is a little bit too clunky without uh, offering needed clarity. The general consensus among folks was that the statement needed to be shorter and much more concise. And also the words, uh, this is important, the words responsible and responsibility are key words that are used a lot in the existing document that need to be defined more tightly what, what do these words really mean? Who else or what else is it that advisors bear responsibility to or 
bear responsibility for? Do they bear responsibility to students? Well, of course, to the profession, to themselves, to higher education uh, more, more broadly. Can or should scholarship be seen as part of this responsibility? And should we distinguish between ethics and values? Uh, another question that was asked is, what is the relationship between the core values and the CAS standards? Now, we don't have clear, unequivocal answers to these questions uh, that are raised here. So this is where we really would like to continue to gather information. And we'd like to hear your thoughts as well. And, and so, Joanne, can you take it from here? Certainly, Jane. Thank you. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is pick up here with some of the value words that we're hearing from members around the globe. And you can see them now on the screen. Uh, it's been interesting that much of the feedback has been very similar across regions and across different venues. So listed on the screen, you will find the top nine value words that have emerged from the feedback collected so far. As you can see, we are beginning to see patterns uh, in the data the values on the screen are actually listed in the order of frequency of the number of times that they have been mentioned by members. So this is probably very good news to all of us because you see top and center is empowerment and many synonyms for empowerment. We also see things on the screen like integrity, honesty, and respect. So probably many of our viewers might identify with some of the tenants that are on the screen. But as Jane mentioned, we're really looking forward to the questions and thoughts from our webinar viewers today. That's a great list. Thank you, Jane and Joanne. Looks like we've had great input at the regional level and the other venues that you've mentioned. Okay, so now that you've heard from the committee on what has been done and themes that have started to emerge, we'd like to open it up to the audience for your comments and questions. Please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to ask the panel any questions you would like at this point. Give us just a minute here to look for questions. Jane, the first question we have looks like a great question for you. Do you anticipate that the new value statement will be as long as the current one? Well, if what I'm hearing from the membership is any indication, then I think the answer is going to have to be no although obviously we don't have that definitively yet. Yeah, the consistent message we got at almost every regional conference was that the current core value statement was a little too long, um, a little too unwieldy. And in looking at core value statements that other businesses and organizations uh, have uh, developed, there's generally considered a, a um, there's generally presented a word or a sentence and with a brief explanation under each one as to um, a, a definition or a clarification of what that term or that sentence means. So as we're talking to more and more people around the country, what we're hearing is that maybe this is the way we need to go, that we need to be much more concise and um, truncated uh, in how we present who it is that we are and what we stand up for. So. So yeah, I think, I think in the end, the membership can look forward to something that's much more, um, much more concise. Great, thanks, Jane. Another question came in. Joanne, I think this would be a great one for you. How do you plan to format or represent the final adopted values? Well, Amy, I probably have to say that we don't have a definitive answer about that one yet either. Uh, but what we do know is that once we have the content finalized, we will find the appropriate experts uh, to work on the format. As Jane just mentioned, we have seen some great samples of how values can be very uh, clearly and succinctly displayed visually that uh, we have found very appealing, but uh, we still have some work to do before we get to that. The ultimate goal here, as Jane already uh, mentioned, is to make sure that the final product is very succinct, that it's usable, that it's easy for all people to use, that it represents uh, NACADA and its members and what we stand for, and that it can easily be used to guide our daily practice. So we don't want people to get lost in the words. We want them to really be able to put them uh, to quick and good use. Great. That makes sense. Thanks, Joanne. 
Another question coming in from another viewer. Um, Casey, I'm gonna throw this one to you because um, you mentioned a little bit about the global community earlier. And this viewer asks, how can we create values for our global community? Thanks, Amy. And I've noticed there's a couple of questions regarding the global community. I think uh, the, the primary way to do that is to make sure that we have our global community representative in the, represented in these discussions. And I think uh, we have attempted to do that, as, as you saw on the committee members. We have a couple of members that are not um, within the uh, United States uh, community. Um, and, and I think, I know that at several of the regional conferences, I know the goal was to try to get anybody attending those conferences uh, from outside of uh, North America to participate. Um, we do have representatives on our committee that are participating, on our committee that have participated. Um, but I think, just like I think what we're doing as an association in general now, anything, any discussions that are occurring within NACADA, we need to make sure that we have voices from outside of North America. And in, in terms of uh, what's going on, the directions we're moving. Um, obviously, our Canadian membership has been a part uh, of, for many years and have been part of that um, and can offer us perspectives. But now, what's really exciting is to see all of the European, the East Asian, the Middle Eastern, um, all sorts of areas uh, from across the, the world. Uh, very interested in what NACADA is doing and looking to us as an association to provide direction for what they would need to do in their areas. Um, so the primary thing is to make sure we have those voices heard as part of our discussions. Great, thanks Casey. Another one, a uh, question that has come in from another viewer is, what's one thing that stood out for you in the region conference session you facilitated? Drew, um, how about you taking a stab at that one? Well, I, I loved the conversation we had in Region 6. I think people were so passionate about their ideas, and I think we're reasonably critical of the, the, um, the past uh, um, core values. And the thing that stood out to me the most was that people were very, very focused on students. Um, and and that, that really, I think, was, was in the heart of the advisors in that session, that sort of that focus on students, how that translates into uh, a specific value, I'm not sure, but I, that was the thing that stood out the most to me was that focus on students. Great. I'd like, yeah, I'd like to underscore that too, if I may. One, uh, what I saw more than anything was passion. So Drew, and Drew used the word passion and uh, the discussions were lively and they were centered mostly on students, not so much on, on well, I shouldn't say not so much on, but they were also focused on advising as a profession. But really, where it was is what can what can we do that communicates our uh, professionalism, our integrity, our passion for the work we do and the students we serve. So uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's a good uh, good way to characterize those discussions. Great, it was great to see so much involvement yeah. at the regional level and people yeah. coming to the session and yeah, it was awesome. So thanks members for being there yeah. and showing up. Another question's coming in from Kathleen. Kathleen asked, what is the plan for translating the core value statement into actionable steps for practitioners? What will it mean in the day-to-day -day life of our advisors? This is Casey, I'd like to answer that one. Sure, Casey, sure. go ahead. Or at least begin. I think, you know, I think um, this goes back to how we actually use the document now. And, and I know as part of the training and development that we start, at least in my office, for all brand new academic advisors, is sharing um, not only what's important on our campus and our office with our specific students, but sharing in general what, what this academic advising thing is all about from an, an international perspective. And I, and I think using the this document, the Nakata Core Values, as well as the CAS standards and the concept of academic advising, I think those are really good documents to use in just general training for any person that's entering the profession or the advising community. Um, and and so that's why updating it and making sure that it's that it's accurate, or it reflects accurately what we're looking for, uh, is is important. But that's what I do, and that's what I hope others do, is that those documents are made readily available to anybody moving into the academic advising profession. I'd like to say a couple things as well. Um, one thing I would say is that they, 
the core values can function as a jumping off point for discussion. So the, we, may, we may adopt a value and, and it's not going to prescribe action if we, if we actually do it correctly. It's going to provide us, uh, it's not going to directly prescribe action, I should say. It's going to give us a, a place to have uh, reasoned discourse about what, what, uh, what our practices in the day-to-day -day ought to be. Um, that's, I guess, my opinion about it. The second thing is that I would be really interesting to hear how members want uh, the values to, to uh, Im be part of their day-to-day -day life as advisors. Um, I think that would really help our task force as we're thinking about uh, and, and firming up the work that we're doing. Amy, I would like to build on that as well. Sure. Uh, just to build on everything else that has been said, I think that the first part of this question comes back to the work of the committee, because I am hopeful that if we do our jobs correctly, that maybe we won't need too much translation, that the core value statements will speak for themselves, and that uh, practitioners will be able to see how they can easily be put to use. And I think that one way that we use them in our day-to-day -day life of advisors is sometimes just even in our conversation with our advising administrators and our leadership to help them see what is really at our core and, you know, uh, what really guides our profession. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll see lots of day-to-day -day, uh, use in the practitioners' lives. Any other comments on that one? Great question, Kathleen. Great discussion. Okay. Let's move on to our next question from Avi, who asks, do we want to distinguish advising from student affairs? Who would care to take a stab at that? Uh, this is Casey. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Thanks, Casey. I think it's important that um, when we think about our roles as academic advisors, it's, it, it's never in a vacuum. and and. And I think we have to remember that whatever roles anybody else is playing at, at our institution, whether they're at your institution, whether they're considered student affairs or academic affairs, I, I think it's just important to understand that if it's all about student success, it really doesn't matter whether it's student affairs or academic affairs. Um, distinguishing advising, many institutions advising is in student affairs. So that's why I don't think it is important to really distinguish it. I think, I think it's important that the, the values will help people understand the role of academic advising as well as how it connects with the roles of all the other individuals at our institutions and, and how we all work for student success. So I don't think it's important that we really distinguish it as long as we have the roles identified and, and the connection to everybody working for the student. So Casey, if I could also uh, add to that, just to give an analogy, for me, it's almost like thinking about the village because we know it takes a village for student success. And I think about academic advising as just one component of that village all working together, uh, as Casey already told us, for the success of the student. I like that. Yeah, that's great. And the core values, I think, will transcend those, those labels, mm -hmm. the academic services or the student affairs sides of the, the house. It's, we're all in it together. I think that's, that's a good way to, to visualize it, Joanne. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Amy, this is Casey. Um, I saw an earlier question that I wanted to make sure I got to, and I actually sent it to both Jennifer and you. I don't know if we can get it up on a screen. The article from Eric White, is uh, again it was called a place at the core um <laughs> academic advising in higher education a place at the core um it the, it was in the journal of general education uh, volume 64 number 4 2015 pages 263 277 uh, published by penn state university uh and there is a url i'm not going to read that off but um but it is uh, eric white the journal of general education public by penn state university Great, thank you for that. All right, let's go to our next question. This is from Kathy. She asks, is the fact that advising differs institution to institution being considered in developing the values? This is a question I think that's not unrelated to the one that was just asked. I, uh, 
the core values I think should transcend institutional types uh, and should again should help to delineate what it is that the profession stands for uh, that takes it beyond time and place and geography. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it does. Yes, and you know, Jane, I just want to add that that was something that we saw at the discussions at the regional conferences, that people really got into deep and intellectual conversations about how is it that we can create values that transcend, as you said, all of institutional types, the roles that we play within our institutions, the types of um, uh, academic advising models that we have. And um, I, I was just so honored to be a part of those conversations because people um, really delved very deeply into that and tried to sort it out. Um, I don't think we came up with all of the answers <laughs> as a result of that, but it was really great to be a part of the conversation and people really trying to come up with um, concepts and tenets that really would be applicable to all types of institutions and all forms of difference. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Let's move on to the next one then. Here's one from our Twitter friends. Um, and this relates maybe back a little bit about the core values, I think, um, and the CAS standards, Casey, you might've been talking about, so maybe we can expand on this. The viewer um, asks, what is the relationship between core values as defined by Nakata and CAS standards? Wow, that, that is a good question. Um, I, I think there's a significant relationship uh, the CAS standards are part of uh, the Council for Advancement of Standards, and that is a, a, that's a, a group of 30 to 40 different professional associations that come up and create those CAS standards. And so I think, um, and, and obviously Nakata has our representative uh, from the executive office that participates in those discussions. And so I think, you know, whatever we create, whatever the Nakata core values becomes, is going to complement, they complement each other in that the core values are something that we as an association uh, deem as standards, if you will, or, or um, just just uh, uh, emphasis that we want our current membership to abide by. The core, the core standards, are, the CAS standards are also similar in the document, but those are meant more to be kind of a program review uh, tool and that will help maybe somebody in a, at an institution or an office, okay, if, if we're gonna have an ideal advising program, these are kind of the steps one, two, three, four. That's, the, that's where I think the CAS standards come into play. The core values are gonna be, I think, much, much more philosophical and much, much more universal in the, it's the why we do advising and who we do it for and what we're about. But I think they're definitely connected as well as with the concept of academic advising. So, yeah, it's part of that triumvirate, isn't it? The, the yeah. concept of academic advising, the core values, and the CAS standards stand, I think, together as uh, creating a, a full view of exactly uh, what this profession is all about and how we philosophically and practically uh, should guide our practice. Yeah, I think they're closely aligned. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oscar? Hi, Oscar. Oscar has asked, what will be the relationship connection between the core values and our mission, vision, and, strateg and strategic goals? Mm. Well, Joanne, I'll get this started. <laughs> you would, Joanne. Yes. So um, there has to be a very, very close relationship and connection. For me, the best word that comes to mind is alignment. And something that Casey said when he said that they will complement one another. Um, it, we truly have not done our job if our resulting core values do not strategically align with the vision, mission, and strategic goals of the association and the work that we do. So <clears throat> I think alignment is is a word that I focus on for this, but I open it up to all my colleagues. So here's Nakata's uh, mission. I just happen to have it in my hip pocket here. 
<laughs> Nakata promotes student success by advancing the field of academic advising globally. We provide opportunities for professional development, networking, and leadership for our diverse membership. Okay. Uh, and then the vision. Recognizing that effective academic advising is at the core of student success, Nakata aspires to be the premier global association for the development and dissemination of innovative theory, research, and practice of academic advising in higher education. Core values, I think, will be, um, well, remember at the, at, the, at the beginning, we talked about the reason for having core values in the first place, which is, gives us a reason for uh, helping define the culture of our association. These help to define, in, in other important ways, without begging the question what our mission is and what our vision is for where the association is to go. So I think all three core values, the vision and the mission, are all sisters in this, in this equation. That's my, my opinion, my two cents. Three cents. That's great. All right. I paused a little bit and no other answers for that. So we'll move on to the next question. Oh, here's a good one from another viewer. Will there be an ethical, will there be an associated ethical document or set of ethical guidelines that discusses how advisors can use the core values to resolve ethical dilemmas? <sighs> <laughs> That's been the question, right? This, um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think, you know, the topic of ethics and academic advising it, it, it is extremely important. Um, I think from my experience, while the, the core values will help set a direction in, in an association wide language of what, what we expect or we hope for from our membership and from our institutions. Um, when it comes to ethics, I think, I think some of the values could use some of the language. It could be considered ethical statements, but I also think that ethics and academic advising to me, that becomes more of an institution discussion because I think it's important mm -hmm. that um, an academic advisor or uh, understand the culture of the institution and then, and then how will that fit within the responsibilities in writing or, or, or those other duties as assigned um, in, in addressing the ethical practices that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think, I think the core values will definitely, I think the language is interchangeable, but I think when it comes to some of the ethical issues, that's where the specific institution needs to have a stake in what those are as well. If, if I can just uh, uh, underscore what Casey said, ethical, what does it, I mean, and I don't mean to oversimplify this, but what does it mean to be ethical? It's, it's trying to dis, uh, determine between right and wrong, mm -hmm. good and bad. Uh, I'm not sure that's what core values are supposed to do. Uh, I think core values need to be a straightforward statement of who we are, what we represent. Uh, I think that, um, and I think Casey may be right. I think we, I think it's important to have that discussion to uh, for advisors to be able to have those ethical discussions about, uh, and they may be institution-wide, they may be association-wide, they may be profession-wide, but my sense, my sense, and I'd be happy to be corrected, is that the core values themselves should not make a statement about right and wrong, good and bad. And I'll, I'll take, I'll be corrected by anybody who wants to correct me. <laughs> That's just my sense of it at this point. I think it would be very difficult to do that. I really yeah. do. So, I mean, and, and that's where we, the, the language needs to be um, universal enough that it, it, it communicates what our values are as an association. But when it comes to each of us doing our individual jobs at our institution, I, that's where I think we have to be careful because you don't, we as an association don't want to exclude anybody because an institution may have specific um, code of ethics or you know, ethical responsibilities. We just have to be careful about that. And I, I would just like to add to everything that's already been said is that um, as, as Jane mentioned, 
they don't they're not synonymous really and so we we for me and I would be happy to be corrected as well but I, I think that we need both I think that we we need core values that are the underpinning of what we do and who we are and I think that there are some general uh, principles of ethics that already exist that we really wouldn't want to interfere with and say that we might have a better list. I mean, you know, when we think about what is morally right, when we think about doing the best for our students and our, you know, institution, when we think about bringing the least amount of harm, I I'm not sure that Nakata could overwrite any of those general guiding ethical guidelines or that we would want to. However, I will, um, I think it's nice to add that the conversation at the regional conference, Region 2, that uh, I attended um, actually talked about this. You know, do we need values and ethical guidelines or will we be able to function if we have our core values and then we use other guiding principles? So maybe the verdict isn't totally in on that yet. Great dis discussion, and I've heard lots of questions also regarding the ethical piece of this. So right. thank you, everyone. It's not it's not an easy or simple answer, is it? Right, right, no. And everybody has their thoughts, exactly. Let's go to the next question. Um, Avi asks, do the panelists agree that the statement should be about who we are rather than what we do? Yes. <laughs> yes, I agree. I, I think it is. It's about who we are because what we do could be different based on each institution. But who we are as an association and what we value, um, I, I, I think that's a much more universal perspective. Okay. Others? All right, we'll go on to the next one. Um, this viewer asks, how will the competencies that are currently being worked on connect to the core values? Uh, is, That's the Professional Development Committee is working on uh, those core competencies for, um, for academic advising, for academic advisors. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to look at those uh, and I think that I, th I think that just uh, they're they're going to be in alignment but they're, they're um, the competencies themselves are different from core values uh, they'll be a nice complement to each other but uh, and I think one will um, influence the other will have some bearing on the other but at this point, I think it's a little bit too early to have the answer to that. I know the, the competencies that they're working on yet are still in process. Okay, great, thank you. The next question, it seems proper re-examination re of our core values might be most effective if our supervisors and those whom we serve are involved somewhere in the conversation. Do you believe it's important to get student and supervisor input regarding what they expect from advising, or will it be more effective for us to clarify what should be expected from our advisors? Uh, well, I think it's important to get as much input as we possibly can. So I, I do think it's a great idea to, to, uh, well, I think we are already seeking some supervisor input because we have so many members who right. are, you know, uh, leaders on our campuses and advising administrators. Um, as far as student input, um, in, it, in addition to graduate students, I don't know that we've done too much with that. So that may be uh, an avenue to pursue and um, get some additional input, something for the committee to consider. I think one challenge of that, and I would welcome any input on it, is how to solicit input of students that is reasonably contextualized, uh, so that they're they're on uh, they have some understanding of advising as it is up until this point. That's that's I, I, I like the sentiment of this. I, I and I think that that's if we were to to seek that uh, would be a, a challenge. Okay, 
It's great. But well, let me, Amy, let me just mention, sure. uh, and um, Drew and I putting our heads together, I mean, maybe we could use peer advisors. You know, maybe we could send this out to some campuses who have a very effective peer advising um, group of students and maybe seek some feedback from them. But I don't know that it definitely is food for thought. Great. That's what we're looking for with this is some other ideas. And so we appreciate that input. So our next question comes from Wendy. And she says, wonderful responses about the use of the core values in day-to-day -day work. So would you say that we should use the core values as the lens through which we approach our role with students? That results in a professional attitude that affects our interpersonal behavior with stakeholders, especially students, as well as the logistics of our practice, I think. And she also adds, did you find that there were any big differences in how advisors view their role on the continuum from handholder to sink or swim? <laughs> Take parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll start. I mean that's a, that's a that's a big. Uh, Wendy gave us a big uh, question to think about. Um, I think that the core values certainly help define who we are uh, to establish what it is we that that's important to us uh, in our profession. I also will go back to uh, what we were talking about earlier and how core values. Uh, is part of that triumvirate with the concept of academic advising and the CAS standards for academic advising and how used together, I think the, the three documents uh, read separately and then taken as a whole represent, um, represent who we are to just about every constituency, I would think, that, that we come in contact with. Now, I'm, that's kind of an oblique answer to Wendy's question, but it's a start anyway. And Jane, just still uh, piggybacking on the first part of what Wendy asks us, I actually like the words that she's chosen as far as, you know, the result is a professional attitude that affects our behavior. Um, when I think about my own core values as an individual, I, I hope that they do that for me. So I think that there are some excellent words there. and. Uh, you know, uh, for us to continue to think about. So thank you, Wendy. Yeah, we'll use that. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I really like the way that um, it, it communicates that the core values help us determine who we are professionally and, and how we value our professional role at our institution. Um, and I, ho I hope that that's the way people have used the core values to this point and, and definitely with what we come up with in, with in the near future. That that's how individuals would use it but I, I love the way that r resonates in answering uh, the this the second part of that I, I did think that there was um, different ways that uh, input from advisors that, that fit along that continuum that you were saying I think that, that was present in the, the listening session that, that I attended in my region so so that that second question there I, I think uh, Many perspectives were were represented, and 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 some tangents probably came came from that. Okay, great, thank you all. Let's skip down to another question here, um, where a viewer asks: Is there a difference between core values for Nakata and core values for the advising profession? I've heard that asked lots of different places I've been. Uh, this is Casey. I, I don't think so. I, I mean, at least when I think about core values for Nakata and core values for the profession, to me, that's the same. I, I'd be happy to be corrected, but I, I see that it's the same. Uh, at the outset, the uh, when we first uh, talked about this last year at the annual conference with the board of directors, uh, one of the issues was, th was this, is this representing, do the core values represent Nakata as an organization or do they represent a profession of advising? And 
yes, Casey, I think the answer is uh, they are probably one and the same. But the what folks were talking about was advising as a profession uh, rather than specifically keeping it to Nakata as an organization. So as a way of saying, what is it that all advisors uh, sh should have as their core values rather than what Nakata specifically should have as its, its core values? Although I, in the end, as you say, I think they're going to be not precisely the same, pretty much closely the same, but it's really defining the profession, I think, as well. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like we have maybe time for one more question. I know there's quite a few still here. Um, let's go down to... As we complete our day-to-day -day activities as advisors, I think it's easy to forget or at least not focus on the theoretical foundations and core values of the advising profession. Do you have any suggestions on how we can continually refocus as individuals and as a larger advising departments on these values to center our work? Burn them into your soul. <laughs> <laughs> they will become part of you. Uh, uh, and I'm going to back off because I'm being silly, but you know, in a way, I'm not being silly. I mean, they should, uh, core values should guide the way we, um, the way we conduct ourselves, uh, generally speaking. It's what we stand up for. It's what we believe in. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to stop there with a few some warnings. So, uh, Casey, you want to go ahead and then I'll okay, sure. go right out. Um, this question reminded me, um, uh, in my team, we do monthly conceptual development activities. And one of the recent activities one of my staff members did was having all of our team think about their own personal advising philosophy. And um, with the whole time that we were talking about this, I kept thinking about, because of what were the discussions we're having with the court and the core values, I kept thinking about how, okay, so how do these values by our association how should they affect um, my own personal philosophy on advising or each of my team members' personal philosophy on advising? And, and we talk about that. We talk about how those core values help somebody at least maybe get clarity in what they, what they should be doing or hopefully spending their time doing um, and shaping how they do their day-to-day -day functions. So um, that was just what I thought of. And um, Amy, I was just going to um, add an answer to the second part of the question. Something that we've recently discussed, and I've discussed it at different campuses, is that we really need to take the time, although it's difficult because we're always so busy, uh, but we need to find times that we're not taking away from students to just sit and come together and talk about this. And much like Casey said, allow uh, academic advisors a chance to sit and reflect and also to bring uh, recent literature to keep up to date because we get so busy in our own practice that sometimes, you know, we don't take the time to ponder the things that are uh, current in the literature or that are being revisited in the literature. And so, you know, brown bag lunches, when, when the um, viewer asked, do you have suggestions on how to do it? I just think we need to plan ways that we can come together and talk about these things and even revitalize one another. I would just uh, add uh, or, or try to, to summarize that if you if you systematize reflection on your practice, that's one way to do it. So think of a way that you could take after each interaction you have with a student and and reflect upon that interaction. And also within that, trying to solicit that external um, input from colleagues, from the students themselves, uh, from the literature. Um, bringing those things together, but 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 think about how in your day-to-day -day interaction can you make that reflection a, a really regular and automatic reflex to practice? Good idea. Great nice. ideas from everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we are nearing the end of our time, and we just want to do a little wrap-up here. So um, I want to thank you all for all your great questions, and the panelists, you've shared a lot of wonderful information from us today. Um, what the committee would like is to give everybody one last chance to provide input con 
um, to consider our core values and drafting our core values. So if you would use um, participants, if you would use the chat function now and add in any additional comments or concerns, or, and if you would answer the question that we've been asking in all the other venues. Jen, could you put, thank you, Jen. As a member of the advising profession, what are the most important values that guide your practice? This is the question that's being asked across at different venues with our members. And if you would just put your comments in the chat function, we'll save those comments and provide those to the, um, the core values committee so that they can use that as they're drafting the new core values. We kept a track of all the questions. Some of you put some comments in the Q&A section and we captured those and we'll also be sharing those um, with the core values committee. So while the participants are adding their thoughts, Joanne, could you share with us maybe what are the next steps you've and have you determined where the committee is going to go from here? Yes, certainly, Amy. Thank you. Um, well, the committee will continue to meet until our task is completed. Um, actually, I'd like to explain to the viewers that the committee, because we are located uh, across the globe, we actually meet through the same venue that we're using today. We use the Zoom technology, and so we can meet as often as needed. Our next Zoom meeting is actually proposed for July, and at which time we'll come together as a committee to look at the data that we have collected so far. Um, at that time, then, we can determine uh, additional venues that uh, we might want to use to seek additional input, maybe reach out to other Nakata leaders that we haven't reached out to so far, perhaps look at uh, peer mentors and some of the ideas that we get from the webinar today. Um, when the time comes that we feel that enough data collection has happened and that is complete, then we will draft a review. Uh, we will draft something for the board to review as far as recommendations for revisions. Um, I don't want to say, Amy, that any of this is definitive because our work is really guided by the committee. So uh, as we continue to meet, the committee will guide our next steps. Great, thank you. That gives us some guidelines of where you're going. Yes. So thank you again. And once again, we'll provide you with the names and emails of the panelists for today's webinar. And you can certainly contact any of us with additional input on the core values. And we also have our executive office um, connection there too for you. Um, Drew, are there any other ways after the webinar closes that members could provide input on the core values? Um, we, we'll have anything that you've entered into the chat or Q&A. Uh, even if so, even if we didn't get to addressing your question, please uh, please enter it there again. Um, you can tweet. Uh, if, if if you're a Twitter person with the hashtag Nakata values, you can uh, see the contact information for, uh, or at least the names of the ta task force members and the contact information for today's panelists and pass along feedback to Charlie Nutt, the executive director of Nakata. Thank you, Drew. And thank you, Jane, Joanne, Casey, Drew for being on the panel today. And behind the scenes, thanks to Jennifer Jocelyn, Lee Cunningham, and Gary Cunningham for making all this magic work for us. And thank you all for participating and, and being here today to ask us the questions. And please join us for the next webinar, which will be on July 19th, Learn Another Approach, Let's Talk Advising. Thank you all for being here, and we appreciate all the input from our members. Thank you. <laughs>